Welcome here to the Oxford Martin School. We're very excited today, today to welcome back uh, a James Martin Fellow, Max Boycoff. I'm Alison Stibby, I'm the Head of Communications here. And when I first started at the Oxford Martin School in 2007, Max Boykoff was one of our very few first James Martin Fellows. He's been working on media and climate change for at least the past several years. And it was a great loss to Oxford when he went to the University of Colorado at Boulder to continue his research. But we're delighted he's here today and we'll look forward to all of your questions after this presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much for coming. I'm, uh, I'm, you know, I've been through the cycles here in Oxford. I was here for three years, uh, and so I know how July can be a very quiet time. So I'm, I'm you know, impressed and, and thankful that you've all uh, taken some time to be here with us today. So I hope we will be productive. I think that we've got about an hour together. Is that right? Uh, and I'll try and stop myself a bit early and open it up for uh, any questions that you may have. I'm always happy for this to turn into a discussion, too. Um, you know, I have, uh, I have slides prepared, and I've got plenty that I can say on this topic. I've been working on it for you know, more or less about a decade now. Uh, and so I can continue to work through this material, but at any point in time, I certainly welcome questions, comments, interjections. Um, I do at the outset also want to just thank you particularly to James Martin 21st Century School. It's here where I really had a great opportunity to uh, meet with other researchers, to broaden my considerations of these kinds of issues. Previously, I had been in the United States, uh, working in California. Coming over here, spending three years in the UK, also working with uh, Ian Curtis, Paul Jepson, and others in the, in the uh, Oxford University Center for the Environment, uh, and James Painter at the School of Journalism really helped me in my thinking and challenged a lot of my uh, notions and arguments. And I, I hope that, you know, it's all been for the better. I'm going to finish, I'm going to start with uh, just some table setting about trends in media, coverage of climate change, media representational practices. I'll walk through a few of the challenges. In fact, I've got an outline here in just a minute. But I'm going to finish with some real uh, ongoing challenges as I see them. That, that we're facing here collectively as we try and translate the formal processes of climate science and policy into people's everyday lives. The challenge of meeting people where they are and then also trying to push people into considering uh, carefully the spectrum of, of possible opportunities for action in the face of climate challenges. So uh, in getting to that place, I'll, I'll be touching on a book that I have coming out in just a couple of months through Cambridge University Press, that other uh, place here in the UK, uh, called Who Speaks for the Climate? So that's the title of this particular talk. Uh, so there are a lot of ways in which this can go, and I've just threaded one way through, kind of a choose your own adventure. Uh, but again, definitely welcome your comments. I, I set these sorts of media representational practices, these considerations of media coverage, in a larger canvas, in a larger landscape of thinking about it through culture and politics. You know, there's uh, the work that, a lot of great work that's done around cultural politics and the environment. Really how meaning is negotiated, uh, how meaning is constructed and maintained across space and place. Uh, that can be across spatial contexts such as here in the UK, across Europe, into places um, in the global south, over to North America. Uh, and also nested questions of how people make sense of and, and value the world around them. So not so much just the discourses that become evident through media representational practices, what sorts of discussions and considerations, finding dominance in these, uh, in these uh, representations, but also what sorts of um, discourses may be muffled or silenced. And I'll bring up one example through, uh, through UK tabloid press, actually, which is something that's been on the uh, uh, on the news docket in, in recent days. Um, and so what's it's along the lines of Jacques Derrida, I'm going to go uh, pretty light on theory today, but in terms of considering what sorts of discourses are muffled and what is absent as well as what's present. And to get at that, we have to consider power processes that manage the conditions of our everyday lives. I end up leaning on the work of Michel Foucault and also uh, 
and, and a number of others in terms of how uh, these circulate through networks that produce these institutions and practices. Uh, and so it's less about, you know, less for questions of me about individual journalists' behaviors, but it's more about the institutional practices and the networks that, that bridge through mass media from formal climate science and policy into the everyday. Uh, it's these larger institutional practices that I'm more interested in, and I'll hopefully demonstrate that as I go. So that is table setting before the table setting, I suppose. But just with the introduction, I'd like to first just talk a little bit about some trends in coverage, and then focus in on a problem of media conflation, and I'll elaborate on that momentarily. Then work through some of the questions of how and why. How are, there, uh, how are processes shaping coverage, and what are some of the, the factors taking place at multiple scales in different contexts? And then, as I said before, uh, moving into present and future challenges, as well as many opportunities uh, in the face of climate change. So beginning with the trends, the role of mass media, um, this is one way of capturing this. Lance Bennett, who's been at the University of Washington in the United States, talking about how a few things are as much a part of our lives as the news. It's become an instant historical record, the pace, progress, problems, and hopes of societies. We may have witnessed with News Corps, Rupert Murdoch, the ways in which these different, you know, the news, the ways in which mass media thread themselves into all the various dimensions of our lives is, is quite stunning. Uh, it reaches a large audience. I've highlighted here the different groups from publishers, editors, and journalists who produce, represent, interpret, disseminate information through what can be considered traditional news sources and then moving into increasingly the questions taken up uh, around new and social media. Neil Gavin, is Neil Gavin here today? Okay, Neil, who's been doing some work in, in Liverpool on this, and others, you know, grad students that I'm working with are taking up these questions, importantly around new and social media and how that's influencing things. Uh, and then finally, this, this distinguishing between what's considered news media and entertainment media. These definitely are blurring all the time. I'm doing work you know, that spans across these areas. I'm going to largely focus today on what's considered news media. But others, uh, non-nation state actors that are moving into this space to be speaking for the climate in a variety of ways through special interests, uh, through the amplified role of celebrity, Ian Curtis working with Oxford United Football Club to bridge into questions around sport through entertainment uh, and media. These are, these are some of the questions that can be taken up. Uh, suffice it to say that media representational practices have been on the increase, a bit like a hockey stick-like increase that have gone up to the present time. Really a great increase around the late, mid to late 1980s for a variety of reasons, such as the formation of the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, Margaret Thatcher in this country had broken her silence when she spoke to the Royal Society, of, uh, the Royal Society about this great human experiment. Uh, there were a number of subplots involved there with the breaking of the coal, coal unions in the late 80s. Nonetheless, speaking on this issue, <coughs> definitely moved this into the public arena. Over in North America, where I'm from, uh, James Hansen testified on the floor of the US Senate, saying it's time to stop waffling, that climate change has begun. Uh, this was during a, a large um, drought that was taking place in North America, along with the heat wave. And this all combined in the public arena to really move it onto the public agenda. The top panel is just pulling from the first <coughs> assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, demonstrating the connections between natural variation and human contributions to climate change and the observed temperature record uh, in black. So as this has moved into um, coverage, it's been taken up more and more by researchers such as myself. I'm going to talk mostly about contemporary coverage. Uh, but before I do that, I just want to talk for a moment about the importance of this sporadic coverage through history. And some of the work that I did in preparation for the book uh, is to look through some old, uh, some early coverage of climate, uh, some early coverage of, as it relates to weather and primarily to agriculture. This came out of the Edinburgh Advertiser, just highlighting one particular piece, focusing on the highlands of Scotland and the carbon cycling through the soils and the effects of climate and weather on 
uh, agricultural production. Some of the early ways, okay, and this is to say, as they talk about how the earth withheld its bounty, is to talk about there are many ways of knowing about these subjects. There is primarily the privileged space that we're in now where there's scientific ways of knowing through climate modeling and so forth. But this observational record is very much a resonant theme uh, that gets taken up time and again. This is around the time what's been now called the mini ice age, I suppose, through when the Thames froze over in 1788, 1789, talking about, again, the connections between weather, climate, and agriculture. Fast forwarding and then crossing the pond to North America, in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, uh, in the state that I'm from, Wisconsin, some connections particularly to agriculture, and then this carbon cycling through the soils, the atmosphere, uh, and so forth. That it's this observational record uh, and this way of knowing that then contributes to what crops up nowadays. This coming just from this last year in the New York Times, connections between extreme weather and weather chaos, a case for global warming. Uh, this is the person, Justin Gillis, who's now been doing a lot of climate reporting, who took, the, took over the role of Andrew Revkin, who many of you um, may know or know about, and, and making the connections between extreme weather events and climate change. And so it's part of that uh, history. If we just focus in on the years really since the turn of the century, or 2004 onwards, this is work that I continue to do with Maria Mansfield, who's here at University of Oxford in the Environmental Change Institute. We're simply monitoring uh, 50 newspapers across 20 countries, broken down into these five regions, looking at the ebbs and flows of coverage over time. And as you maybe look at this immediately, you can think about some of the reasons behind this increase at the end of 2006 and 2007, and then another spike at the end of 2009. Um, this helps as a way in, just looking at the quantity of coverage, as a way into then considering questions around content that I'll be turning to uh, in just a moment. End of 2006 and 2007, we've attributed this largely to uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Fourth Assessment Report, um, the influence of, of the film Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth. I actually moved over here in 2006. Um, the An Inconvenient Truth was released in the United States in May. I moved here in the summer and it was released in the UK and around the world in the fall and afterwards. And uh, you know, Ian Curtis actually had invited me to speak at the Phoenix um, up in Jericho about the film and things. And it was one of my first memories here in Oxford that I thought, okay, you know, I, watch the film, I'll think carefully about some questions that people may have. All the questions that I got on that day, I think just about every single one was, what's going on in the United States? What's going on over there? <laughs> but this was a way into considering the cultural elements of uh, engagement with climate change at the policy level, particularly in uh, the United States in that film. And then at the end of 2009, you might be able to uh, speculate that this is from the Conference of Parties meetings in meeting in Copenhagen with a great deal of anticipation, particularly with the election of Barack Obama and thinking that we would be able to move the uh, international negotiations forward. A piece of this, which I don't have other figures with me today, but a piece of this taking up the question around the University of East Anglia email hacking scandal, um, also somewhat affectionately sometimes referred to as climate gate, uh, the influence that that had on this increase uh, it's something that I've taken up elsewhere. Um, it's just a part of that larger spike during that time. You can see that overall there has been a uh, stagnation, maybe even a decrease in recent years. We actually have improved upon this, I think, by breaking it down to the number of articles per newspaper as well. So we have both these figures, and then we have it at the country level at this website here um, for the US, UK, and for India, individual papers. But this helps us number of articles per newspaper because each of the regions, I think the European region has 13 papers, US has nine. So this helps actually as a sort of a normalization. But you can see this stagnation into recent time. Um, and this can be attributed to this finite news hole, uh, to maybe some questions around climate fatigue. We could certainly open it up to, I think, a productive discussion, but your comments as well uh, at the end. Did you have a comment right now? Yeah, I just wondered what the proportion is of this number of articles in those newspapers. The as as opposed to other articles. 
much yeah, that, good question. That the, the I haven't seen figures on that in particular globally, but in the United States, there are figures, the Pew Center for people in the press, they do a lot of monitoring, and roughly about 2% of coverage is on the environment in that wider news hole. Um, in newspapers, it's a little bit more. That's across all media. Uh, newspapers is up to 2.7, I think. Uh, and then in television, down to 1.5%. But that's all of environmental issues. So climate change, being an increasingly dominant piece of that, um, is even less. So, you know, it's difficult to say how much you can extrapolate that out to global coverage, but that's about the ballpark. Yeah. Okay, so these are, you know, we continue to monitor this. There are some questions around capacity issues in South America and Africa. There are a lot of important uh, projects underway to try to increase capacity in the places that are, seem to be at the forefront of climate impacts, um, such as the International Institute for Environment and Development, uh, the Panos Institute, both of them out of London and others. Um, and it's starting to be detected, maybe, in this global coverage. But I'd like to turn to uh, the question, the problem of media conflation. How many of you remember the great global warming swindle, this film that came out on Channel 4, Martin Durkin? Yeah, some nods. So this you know, can encapsulate the sort of thing that I'm going to get at in the next few slides. That this film had, had in, in some ways, very successfully conflated a number of distinct issues within climate science and policy as one great global warming debate. And in so doing, it actually done a disservice to public understanding, to, to uh, more effective public engagement on climate change, not to prescribe any particular form of climate action, but just for a more informed public to decide on what to do about climate change. And that is a more piece of more general trend within mass media that can be to conflate a number of distinct issues into that great cold warming debate. So I have four panels here. And then I just have four more as examples in the next slide that follows. But this is some work just that's an effort to try and uh, break down the various dimensions of this larger umbrella of climate science and policy. So the first we can think about increased CO2 warms the planet. And so this is a nice schematic just to try and capture the spectrum of scientific uh, views, relevant experts doing work around increased CO2 warming the planet that underneath the curve, there's a very constrained, you know, most scientists are agreeing here, if not just about all, that there is an association, increased CO2 warming the planet. There can be this contribute to a divergence, pulling this apart, if you think about the schematic, that, you know, new information that may challenge that can, can contribute to a divergence, but overall the evolution of scientific information here continues to, to push this in further, further converge on that uh, consensus of this converging agreement. A second example, humans contribute to climate change. Again, another very focused curve. Under the curve, great deal of agreement. On the tails, these are what it can be maybe denigratingly referred to as alarmists. On one side, one tail, and contrarians on the other. <clears throat> alarmists, those that say that, you know, if we can just rein in our sinful ways, that we can quote unquote stabilize the climate. This can be captured by some social movement groups here in the UK, the Stop Climate Chaos Movement. While, you know, once you get beneath that uh, claim, there's a lot more texture and a lot more understanding of the detail. But, but that stopping of climate chaos tends to suggest that if we rein in human contributions, that, uh, that you can stop climate change. And so that is actually part of the tale here. On the other tale, contrarians, many of them more prominent in the United States, uh, those that say that human contributions to climate change remains negligible. Um, you know, there's a lot of debate about their relative influence. James Painter's uh, engaged in research that's trying to look at this, not just in the United States, but around the world. Um, I just two weeks ago was at a, at a meeting of, called the Heartland Institute, which is a libertarian think tank that brings in people that continue to question the role of human contributions to climate change. And I have been doing some field work quote unquote there, try to better understand the, the dimensions of this climate skepticism or contrarianism. But that's a second example. A third 
Anthropogenic climate change increases hurricane intensity. In this particular case, you can think of it as a bimodal distribution. But there are folks that are saying there are these connections that are being detected. Uh, Judy Curry at Georgia Tech, Carrie Emanuel at MIT, uh, Greg Holland at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, where I am, and many others who have been detecting this thing. Well, there's other scientists that say it's still too early to tell. And this is part of a, an ongoing, vigorous debate happening within relevant expert communities around climate change. And then finally, Kyoto Protocol's success. These are statements that came out of a piece I wrote for Nature Climate Reports a number of years ago. But this can be all across the board. Some people saying that it's a complete waste of time, to it's a panacea, and many of the, the uh, viewpoints in between, that it can be a step towards more productive, ongoing discussions. But suffice it to say again that these are very distinct issues, and to the extent that mass media are fusing these into this great global warming debate, that it's doing a disservice to the larger public, to policy actors that are heavily leaning on, uh, that are leaning on mass media as a proxy for understanding where the science, uh, where the scientific research is, where the public are on these sorts of issues. So it remains a problem. Now, that was just working through the conceptual. I have two short video clips I want to share with you. The first is at the national level, just to, just to embody some of this. And they're both examples in the United States. Things you know, this is where the rubber meets the road. These are where concepts find they play out every day in coverage in the United States and elsewhere, particularly on television, propping up dueling scientists or dueling experts. You know, what constitutes expertise? In this case, Lou Dobbs, a prominent commentator, had talked about one of the founders of the Weather Channel, this person, John Coleman, who's really made a name for himself in terms of uh, skepticism as a weathercaster out of San Diego, California and how it's a great hoax. You know, he's said that many, many times. Propped up against uh, this other climate expert. Um, another, as he talked about at the outset, juxtaposing Ban Ki-moon's comments about economics with whether the climate's changing at all. And there's a quick movement between those. But it was that conflation at work uh, once again. There's also you know, stock footage, work around imagery that um, people are taking up, Saffron O'Neill and Sophie Nicholson Cole, University of East Anglia have done a lot of good work on this, and I'm working with them to try and understand it across country contexts more now. 
And then also there are these questions about just, you know, our visceral reaction to maybe John Coleman is this, you know, wizened, uh, fairly loose, comfortable person in front of the camera. And Henry Pollock, who's a little bit more of, you know, a little bit more stiff in his presentation and how that influences the audience. Beyond just those of us who are interested in these things in this room, but the wider general public. These are some of the questions that we can uh, perhaps take up. I'm going to move to the second example now. This is more moving down to the local. And this was only uh, brought to my attention because you might detect here Timmons Roberts, who's now heading the environmental studies program at Brown University in the United States, who had been a James Martin Fellow as well. Uh, and I believe it was 2006, 2007. Uh, but he had passed me this. It's just one example of a Saturday talk show, or maybe Newsnight, right? Or these sorts of programs where these discussions and debates are are held. Let's see. Now, on 10 News to 10 News. Today on 10 News Conference Special Assignment, Global Warming, Fact or Fiction? If it is happening, what's the cause? And what effect will it have on coastal areas like here in southern New England? If you listen to the proponents, the atmosphere is warming, the glaciers are melting, and sea levels are rising because of pollutants like carbon dioxide man is putting in the air. And if we don't act now, they say the changes to civilization will be catastrophic. On this program, we'll talk about what they suspect will happen. But if you listen to the opponents, they say man is not the cause of global warming, it's the sun. And all the hype of hysteria is to keep scientists awash in their $50 billion worth of research grants they've received from governments and corporations over the past two decades. What's really going on? Now, from NBC 10 News, Southern New England's news leader, this is the team you trust with 10 News Conference. Good morning, everyone. I'm RJ Hyde. We have both sides covered. My guest today, Timmons Roberts, director of the Center for Environmental Studies at Brown University. He's the fellow on the screen left. And uh, his climate specialist, Tim Herbert, professor of geological sciences and environmental sciences at Brown University. Tim says the geologic record clearly indicates a first order relationship between climate and CO2. On the other side is Art Horn, a meteorologist and climate specialist. He says there is no scientific proof that human emission of carbon dioxide causes global warming and that the theory has been completely disproven. Changes in the sun and the oceans drive the climate. Now, uh, Okay, so you can see the setup in this particular example, more down to the local level. Uh, you know, there are many things that can come up here as well. But one of them that, that strikes me is having, you know, both sides covered, this, this conflation again. But uh, this person, the moderator, R.J. Heim, I, having seen this a number of times now, just uh, my heart goes out to him a bit as a generalist journalist trying to cover the intricacies, the complexity, the high stakes area, the politicized space of climate science and policy. It seems clear that you know he's just basically reading about the geologic record of the first order relationship between CO2 and, and global warming. That he's just reading about these things and he's really clinging on to try and put together some sort of uh, discussion here. You know, he may be talking about school lunches, he may be talking about education the following Saturday, but these are some of the challenges involved. And so within journalism, again, to return to, it's not individual journalists necessarily, but you can have really good journalists, but they're swimming upstream against these larger political economic currents of, of a shrinking newsroom, of tighter uh, space, you know, less space to be covering this, of quicker deadlines and these sorts of things that have been documented over time. It really works against uh, some of these complex issues, not just climate change, but other global change uh, considerations. So these are just a few examples of media representations, both taken from the United States, where I'm more familiar uh, now. But I want to turn to some of the questions of how and why, uh, and then wrap things up. So how do these factors shape media representations of climate change. There are a number of contextual factors. And as I go into, I think I have maybe about six here, I just uh, alert you to Mike Hume's book, Why We Disagree About Climate Change. You may have um, read it or may be familiar with his uh, contributions, really asking questions about how our values and how our different political 
perspectives and experiences can shape this space of agreement or disagreement. And that's really the sorts of contextual questions that, that um, I allude to here. Technical capacity issues, this is just referring back to what I said about R.J. Heim, the moderator, that specialist training is you know, shrinking. Those journalists that have access to the peer-reviewed literature, that, can, that have the time and space to be speaking offline with top climate experts, is disappearing. And they have to file a story, and they have to move on to the next one as quickly as ever. Uh, this has been documented by researchers at University of Cardiff uh, in the UK, and many at the Pew Center for People in the Press in the US and elsewhere. Weather events themselves, this notion of dirty weather is something that's been cropping up. The connections between extreme weather events and climate change, that this can be a contextual factor. We saw the Lou Dobbs example. This took place during heavy snowfalls in the east coast of the United States, definitely contributing to the line of questioning, the way that he framed these arguments about cold winter and global warming, that dirty weather events uh, can shape this. Philosophical perspectives, uh, this is something that Mike Hume takes up in particular. Uh, Mark Sheenan, <coughs> who does a lot of work around uh, ethics and environmental issues, also thinking about our, how our philosophical perspectives are uh, brought to bear on these kinds of uh, questions. Cultural differences, trust in science and media. Uh, in the United States, Anthony uh, Lizerowitz has an ongoing project called Six Americas, looking at different groups of people in the United States and their relative levels of trust in science and media and how that may influence their stated, um, their stated uh, support for a range of climate actions. Political economic drivers and factors, such as mass media consolidation, how that then influences the spectrum of possible individual journalist behaviors. And then this last one, journalistic norms, pressures, and values. And I'll elaborate on this in the next uh, slide in just a minute. Some of the different journalistic norms that shape this process. So this can take a little bit of time to, I suppose, fully um, you know, appreciate and, and uh, work through, but I just want to put it up there maybe as a placeholder. This is Annabella Carvalho and Jacqueline Burgess have tried to put together a model to understand how the production of, of uh, news, texts, images, stories move into the public arena above the axis and they are taken up in public, in the public, in combination, in, uh, you know, really fighting for attention with a number of other issues. You can think of that as the public carrying capacity with, you know, wars in foreign places, with uh, immediate concerns in local communities, how this issue of climate change may be taken up and then incorporated below the axis into our own personal engagement and awareness, okay? This is the passage of time. So at any time splice, all of these things are going on. There's the, the movement of text and images in the public arena, how they're taken up, how our lived cultures and social relations are influenced by them. So, you know, Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth may be inspiring for some of us and may be repulsive to others. And it's not to say that, you know, this is to dispel the myth of the information deficit model. And if we can just provide more information, people will make the right choice. And instead, it's a very complex and dynamic process over time. So with these contextual factors, there are many of these complex issues unfolding. But we can see it again uh, concretely in another article in the New York Times. Let's take another example. Climate fight heating up in the deep freeze. In that contextual uh, space of the heavy snowfall moving into uh, the, the meetings that were taking place on Capitol Hill around cap and trade legislation. Uh, James Inhofe, one of the prominent climate contrarians in his extended family, built an igloo. A six foot tall igloo on Capitol Hill put a sign in it and said, Al Gore's new home. Okay? This made it to the front page of the New York Times, it was prominently placed here uh, above the fold, and this was actually, to be fair, continued on page 18, but who reads 18 in any detail? You know, there's quite a bit of drop-off, and there's a lot of documentation about exactly how much drop-off there is. The people that read the front page and then continue on to read uh, what others have to say that, that contest this notion of extreme weather reinforcing doubts about science conclusion of global warming is unequivocal and most likely caused by human activity. 
So this is just a piece, one example of how this plays out in the contemporary space. And again, it can tether us back to these resonant considerations of connections between weather and climate. So moving to journalistic norms and pressures. There are a lot of, uh, well, I have five mapped out here that in early work that I've done with my brother, uh, Jules Boykoff, who's a professor of politics at uh, Pacific University in the United States. We worked through how different issues, events, and information work through these journalistic norms to become news and media coverage, and how journalists grapple with this in order to create the news stories that get picked up, uh, picked up in the press, deemed worthy as news. So novelty, something that's new, personalization, these dueling personalities, uh, dramatization, maybe a weather event. Um, one of the prominent ones in research that I've done, Hurricane Katrina, is a real uh, pivotal point in history. There's still a lot of discussion and debate about the connection between hurricane activity, intensity, and frequency, climate change, but nonetheless, this became a news hook for stories about climate change. Reliance on authority and order, when people in positions of power say things about climate change, this generates news much more readily. And then finally, this journalistic norm of balance reporting. This is something that I tested empirically in the US and the UK press about to what extent have human contributions to climate change been covered in, uh, how accurately have they been covered in the US and UK press, and how much journalists may have been relying upon this journalistic norm of balance reporting to the detriment, actually, of accurately reporting this convergent agreement of this consensus on that point. So, you know, there are examples all the time. The climate feud can prop up these two dueling personalities, Al Gore and Sarah Palin, having it out amidst a background of evolving climate science and policy work going on. But we're going to look to these two that make the new story, okay? Often to the detriment of deeper public understanding and engagement. So this is another example, just very briefly, newspaper coverage of climate change in the UK and India. This bridges to work that I've done with Maria Mansfield while here in Oxford and also ongoing work with Emily Boyd, who's uh, been at Leeds University. And so part of the earlier work with Maria, we had interviewed tabloid news reporters about how they were covering climate change. And maybe it's my exotic American accent, but um, you know, I got a lot of pretty candid comments from them, uh, to their credit. One of them, Jane Hamilton from The Sun, said, the key is relevancy. We cover issues that most immediately affect our readers. Okay, so this was, a, was, this was consistent with many of the comments that I got from these journalists, that they're thinking about uh, tabloid leadership, often considered as working class people, okay? Part of the reason that I, we look to these newspapers, too, is that, as you all probably know well, the daily average circulation in these working class newspapers are as much as 10, 12 times greater than that of the Guardian and the Independent on a daily basis. And so if we're actually looking to wider public understanding, you know, often we look to the Guardian, Independent, Telegraph, Times for considering who are influential policy actors, who are opinion leaders, but as far as moving a larger populace, we need to look and analyze these particular papers about what people are reading and discussing on a daily basis. So we did a frame analysis across uh, seven years of study. This can be difficult to, to maybe see from the back, but just largely grouping them in terms of different science issues covered over time, culture and society issues, political and economic issues, and then finally, ecology and meteorology issues themselves across different papers over this span of time. We went into much more detail, but this is kind of the top line assessment. That would, may not be surprising that political actors and weather events themselves are the top two sorts of issues covered, as well as biodiversity, charismatic megafauna, that get covered in these papers. Papers that you know, have very short articles on climate change that don't go into the kind of depth that Guardian Independent Telegraph Times often do. But this was the reliance uh, in these articles over time. One of the things that we pointed out in our work was that issues of justice and risk, more complex issues, issues of public understanding and education, 
were very much undercovered issues. And so doing this kind of work helped us reveal some of the patterns of this coverage over time, which we argued could challenge these assertions of actually reaching out to issues that immediately affect readership. You can have a debate about this, but working class people here in Britain could be considered also to be at the forefront of climate impacts in the, in now and in the years to come. So maybe these issues around justice and risk, ethics, inequality, and adaptation could be something that we could challenge tabloid journals to be covering much more of the climate issue. We extended this methodology over to looking at India and looking at prominent English language newspapers, the Hindu Times of India, India Express, and Hindustan Times. And just some initial research, and we've also gone into a lot more detail with this work, is looking at how weather events were actually covered much less in a pattern over time, along with justice and risk. But we start to draw the work that we're writing up now. What are some of maybe the differences? What are some of the legacies of colonialism uh, and the connections to uh, public engagement with climate change across these two country contexts? So that's an example of the sorts of things we can draw out, uh, also in tandem with uh, interviews with journalists, interviews with policy actors, interviewing the additional municipal commissioner in, in November of 2009 or this was early 2009, we are the victims of climate change. This, this uh, villain victim, um, often this discourse that's prominent in Indian newspaper coverage, how this then played out and the sorts of issues that were being covered and how. So I want to turn to, well, I want to talk very briefly about two examples and turn to conclusions because I want to open it up for questions and discussion uh, if you guys have some comments. So first, what does this mean for researchers ongoing, interacting with the media? Thinking about many of you here who are considering how to talk about your own, the importance of your own research. You know, people can talk about this as dumbing down your research for the public. I think it's just the opposite. In terms of thinking carefully about how to smarten up the way that you communicate your work so that it's relevant to meeting people where they are. Uh, and presumably the sort of work that you do is meaningful to somebody, right? Um, so, in terms of climate change, Henry Pollack, who was one of the people interviewed opposite John Coleman on that uh, first clip, he talks about this as the challenge of translating error bars into ordinary language. And we can take this a little bit further. These are through interviews that I've done on, on some of the research on this in the U.S. context. That Malcolm Hughes had said to me, you know, we scientists are a little too unwilling to say things as we see this misuse of information and policy. Now part of the context of his statement here is that he was the second author on the Man at All hockey stick study from 1998 that was picked apart uh, in a number of uh, congressional committees in the United States where he actually had his tree ring data from the 1960s subpoenaed as evidence to question this hockey stick data uh, that came out in 1998. Then he withstood a lot of these pressures, but he found it to be very distracting to try to do the sorts of work that, that he said that he wanted to do in the world, ongoing research. It was difficult to continue to do both of these things. And yet, this has a real agenda setting function. Al Gore has talked about this, many others, talking about, you know, if, if the relevant expert scientists themselves are recoiling from the public space, journalists need copy. Journalists need to talk to the top experts. And in the absence of that, there are others, you know, sometimes funded by carbon-based industry, sometimes funded by other special interests, that are happy to step into this space and give journalists newsprint. And that does not help them get this, the best stories out. And so it has an agenda-setting function. And just as a sort of an aside, the Onion newspaper that you might be familiar with reminds us <coughs> That, you know, it's not for everybody. That actually, some of these experts are better left uh, in the dark spaces <laughs> in our esteemed colleges here at Oxford University. Sometimes too boring for television. Second and a bit shorter example, just to get us at this uh, interaction within the newsroom. Okay, so there are a lot of processes that are involved in negotiating between journalist copy and the sub-editors themselves, and then editors and reaching print. This is a piece, you know, as a regular reading of, reader of The Guardian and the Observer, 
came out in 2008, surgeon fatal shark attacks can see, laying down global warming, a scary shark photo that is something that um, is also worth discussion perhaps later. But the author quoted uh, this person, George Burgess, actually pointing out that <clears throat> the most prominent thing going on here is during the booming economy, or during, not the booming economy, but during the tourist season, that there are just more people in the water. And so the frequency of shark attacks is associated with more human contact hours in shark infested mm -hmm. waters. Later on, the statement is just made here with this uh, very speculative comment that another contributory factor to the location of the shark attacks, it could be global warming or rising sea temperatures. And so this is a speculative comment that was actually picked up by the sub editor and placed there as surgeon fatal shark attacks blamed on global warming. Okay, so these are the sorts of things that can happen, right? Just as another temporal dimension to this, a follow-up blurb <laughs> in the world, some eight months later, that sharks go hungry as tourists stay home. Again, relying on George Burgess as an expert here. But you know, the inadvertent reader who's reading paging through on an issue that they may not be following so closely, like most of us being in this room, may be inadvertently making this connection between shark attacks and climate change. It may be nested in the residual, which is hard to do, hard to, uh, you know, hard to find the signal as a researcher on this, but may have residual influences on connections made between things such as scary shark photos and shark attacks and climate change and the urgency for action in the face of climate change. So this is another example of generating stories in the newsroom. Actual, the real effects that this may have on public understanding and engagement. So, some final comments. New and social media, as I said before, are really changing this landscape. We're moving a lot from broadcast media, where we're subjected, maybe less so over time, to a range of views where we can work through interactive media to search out the views that maybe we agree with or to search out the views that we heartily disagree with just to fortify our views as to why we disagree with them, right? That in this interactive media space, there can be new visibility, but there can also be new challenges. Um, in the United States, there's a lot of documentation that internet usage is outpacing newspapers. This has continued over time. Within this, the Project for Excellence in Journalism has um, documented time and again how the blogosphere, those uh, issues taken up in new and social media, global warming or climate change is much more prominent than it has been in traditional news media. Um, so at the time of Tiger Woods, that actually climate change and global warming was a much more prominent issue. And this has continued on Twitter, with global warming being a prominent issue, uh, and this has continued over weeks, uh, over the, since they started documenting this in January of 2009. Now, I'm not aware of, of this kind of content analysis in the UK. Otherwise, I would have loved to incorporate it here. Uh, but this coming out of here is just one indication about how this can be much more prominent on the news agenda and news social media. But we can still ask a lot of questions about to what extent is this just noise? And to what extent are these just debates? And where are the signals within this noise? That, uh, you know, when the climate gate scandal was breaking, there were a few uh, new and social media journalists that were more than happy to point out that they, as investigative bloggers, were the ones that broke the story. But, you know, five uh, internal and, and external independent investigations later, finding that the climate scientists themselves were absolved of, of ethical you know, wrongdoing, as it was defined that you know, we can ask the questions about how much does this whip up a frenzy beyond maybe more measured considerations that are taken up in traditional media. So there are ongoing challenges here, certainly. Another element here is the treatment of climate change is increasingly considered just like any political issue on the public agenda, okay? Um, and this can be a real uh, dangerous facet here. One example, can come from BBC populist polling. Do you think that global warming is taking place? Now we can look outside today and we can say it's a beautiful day in Oxford. Maybe it is. We, it's hard to say. Uh, and this statement can then privilege belief, 
can privilege, you know, maybe enroll our hopes, can privilege observational in information, maybe in place of scientific information, expert uh, modeling work. And so this can be actually part of something that would confuse it. Now, I think it's safe to say that if we did a poll, most people would hope that climate change weren't a contemporary challenge. We've got other things to think about. So this belief in global warming can actually has the possibility of confusing uh, these issues in the policy sphere. One can ask a very useful question about, do you think carbon taxation is a viable policy tool to deal with climate change? That can be a very different set of questions. Okay? So that's part of the challenge here. When taking evidence-based science uh, and propping it up as questions of belief. Now, just to put in another marker of news and entertainment media that I mentioned at the outset, that these are increasingly uh, being populated by celebrities, by people within sport, by people within various special interest groups that are trying to influence this process. So it's becoming a much more congested space than ever before. And this is having a, a range of uh, both positive, negative, uh, and you know, debatable influences over time. And then um, you know, one of the final comments that climate change for me university, this is just a quote out of the Guardian today, you know, interesting turn of phrase in light of uh, Rupert Murdoch actions. But this can raise questions about net neutrality legislation that's prominent in the United States where there can be a pay for, you may have to pay for faster internet access, and how this can actually be to the detriment of people impacted by climate change, those that may not have uh, open access to, to information about climate change. Uh, but questions about the combination between climate and other global change issues and media diversity are ongoing challenges um, and considerations. So to finally conclude, Many uh, prominent challenges continue. Effective and appropriate news hooks, uh, trying to continue to do illuminating work amid these shrinking budgets for news. Journalism certainly is not easy work nowadays, um, if you can get it. Uh, mobilizing metaphors and analogies, again, smartening up one's language, thinking about how to communicate one's own research is an ongoing and formidable challenge. Continue to have consistent interactions offline, behind the scenes, with public policy actors to build this uh, baseline of information so that when things break, when there are news pieces, that people can place this uh, more readily into context. Navigating through how to value these different ways of knowing, through observational and experiential access to these, these ways in which knowledge is generated through experts. And then finally, just this ongoing general challenge of translating these complexities uh, in this high stakes and highly politicized arena. Um, and so for anybody doing work in this area, you can certainly appreciate uh, how this is such a high stakes issue now. And I'll finish with this quote from Shakespeare, where, you know, not to dismiss different influences, but the world is a stage. And as each of us move in to try and influence it, uh, and I'd like to think in, in positive ways as we see it, uh, we do have our exits and our, en our entrances, that this is an ongoing and enduring challenge that we're continuing to face. And so understanding how this gets translated from formal climate science and policy processes into the everyday, I think continues to be an ongoing and formidable challenge. So thank you again very much for inviting me in, and uh, certainly welcome your comments and questions at this point.